In this episode, Dr. Eliana Perrin discusses the importance of clinicians and caregivers in childhood obesity prevention. She talks about how parents can help their children establish healthy habits from an early age and how clinicians can better intervene to prevent childhood obesity during and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. Tune in to learn how healthcare providers can better equip parents and caregivers to prevent childhood obesity. Podcasting from Dallas, Texas, I am Shireen, and this is the Yumlish Podcast. Yumlish is working to empower you to take charge of your health through diet and exercise and reduce the risk of chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes and heart disease. We hope to share a unique perspective and a culturally relevant approach to managing these chronic conditions with you each week. Dr. Eliana Perrin is a general pediatrician, researcher, and expert in childhood obesity prevention and treatment. She focuses on communities that have been systemically disadvantaged. She studies how primary care teams can partner with families to help them engage in health behaviors throughout their child's life. She's a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor in the Department of Pediatrics and School of Medicine, Nursing, and Public Health. Welcome, Dr. Perrin. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Shireen. An absolute pleasure. So, Dr. Perrin, what really drew you to medicine? How did you become involved in pediatric medicine? Well, like so many um, folks, I really wanted to help improve people's lives. I've always been fascinated by the doctor-patient relationship and that ability to get to know someone well and by knowing them well, knowing how to keep them healthy, help them get over illnesses. Um, In terms of pediatrics, I've always loved children um, and helping them grow up healthy is really an honor. I also really love pediatricians, so I'm constantly working with colleagues that are just wonderful people. That's lovely. So can you briefly describe to us this the current state of childhood obesity in the United States. Um, How big is this problem? Yeah, unfortunately, the rates of childhood obesity are not improving. Um, We know that about one in five children are obese and um, the rates of severe obesity are actually rising. Um, And this epidemic hits communities that, like you said in my bio, have been systematically disadvantaged the hardest. Unfortunately, we know that childhood obesity often tracks into adult obesity, which is why I and so many of my colleagues are actually spending a lot of time trying to prevent obesity. It's very hard to treat. But all of this is not surprising because we have an incredibly toxic food environment in this country where calorie rich but nutrient poor food is the cheapest and nutrient rich and calorie poor food is the most expensive. And really often out of reach, either financially or logistically for our families with lower incomes. And we have a tough time being active because there are often not safe spaces to play or run or our days are very scheduled with few activity breaks. So really, it's a perfect storm. How do clinicians generally approach childhood obesity prevention with parents, families? Yeah, No, it's a great question. But in my opinion, clinicians often start way too late in a child's life. Um, So we know from some of our own research that behaviors like television watching, juice and sugar sweetened beverage drinking, et cetera, all of those things start really early, way earlier than you'd think. But there's another reason to start early. And that's that if children are newborns, If we start when children are newborns in a relationship with parents that lets them know that our job is to partner with them to keep their children healthy, then those conversations go way better throughout the child's life. If the first time someone engages in a conversation about healthy behaviors or obesity prevention is at age 10, let's say, when a child is already overweight or obese, it's a harder conversation. It's an important one, but it's a harder one. And when we do engage with um, parents in conversations, we always like to ask them permission about whether it's okay to discuss this. And then we really work to explore families' values and desires with regard to any kind of behavior change we're talking about. 
We also always work to keep the conversation about health rather than weight. You know, one of, one of the things I find interesting is that we, we live in this culture of, you know, getting, you know, immediate results. You, you hear out there 30 days, 30 pounds, and I mean, some, some crazy things out there. What do you say to some of that quick fix, um, you know, especially when we're talking about childhood obesity? Well, it can be very tempting, um, but usually so many of those plans are not very healthy and they're not very sustaining. And uh, eating that way or being active that way for a short period of time isn't nearly as helpful as making small changes that are more sustainable over a long period of time. What improvements, if any, can be made with provider and patients and that interaction that happens there? So I always like to share that this is a partnership, that we care about children's health and that we want to help the family focus on healthy behaviors and good decisions for that reason. And like I said, even some small decisions can make a big difference. And many of these behaviors um, that we're talking about can have other positive influences. For example, getting outdoors, being active can certainly help with obesity, but it can also help with mental health and drinking less sugary beverages helps with making sure you have um, an appetite for foods with better nutrients and it can help toddlers have less diarrhea and it can even help them have better teeth. Drinking more water, eating more whole grains, fruits and vegetables, that can help with constipation, which is often a big um, problem um, for kids and one that parents come to us about frequently. So there's often more than one reason to adopt some of these healthy behaviors and sometimes different aspects are motivating to different people. We doctors may care about obesity a lot, um, but parents may care about constipation or something else. And at the end of the day, it's important that our interactions with patients give them important information, allow them to be empowered to change whatever behaviors they're motivated to change, and for the reasons that are consistent with their values. What, what do you say to this? Because, you know, one of the things that we hear about from the doctor side is to say, listen, I only have... 10 minutes with that patient or their family, I can't go into so much detail. I just don't have the bandwidth because I have to move on to the next patient. What, what would you say to that as we're talking about this provider-patient interaction? No, it, it comes up all the time. And, you know, primary care providers are so stretched these days. And my hat goes off to each and every one of them, and um, and they are stretched, and there are high expectations about all the many things to cover. I find that often easing into this conversation the way I shared, really trying to get at the family's values, their priorities, their interests, can actually save time. It's actually remarkable, you know, kind of when you go in there and you say, well, this is what I need you to do, and, you know, you're going to get some pushback, and then if you push back to that, Suddenly, it's a long conversation and not a very pleasant one for anybody. But if you go in and, um, you know, you're really thoughtful about, you know, how can I help this family get to where they want to get to and listen for just a you know, couple minutes at the beginning, sometimes you can make a lot of progress in a very short amount of time. And, you know, we call this motivational interviewing and there's all kinds of people who really train best practices in motivational interviewing. But it it really starts with, you know, just being very open, rolling with resistance, finding out about families' values, making sure you have permission for this type of conversation. And if you if you don't take the shortcuts and actually do this, it actually saves time. You know, many children live in disadvantaged environments that make it difficult to eat healthy food, access safe spaces to exercise. How can healthcare professionals better help parents and caregivers really navigate these toxic food environments? Yeah, and this is such a big area of my research and so many of my colleagues. Um, we do a lot to try and help parents and pediatricians partner on exactly this. So we talk about pediatricians giving immunizations, right? That's like one of the big things that we do. And I like to say that we need to immunize against the toxic food environment. If only we could, right? But we, we do still really try to help parents find inexpensive and safe ways to stay active and eat healthy. And much of what we recommend is either free or cheap because our parent, our families that we take care of, they don't have a lot of resources. 
So we encourage things like tummy time and floor time for infants. You don't need a fancy exercisor. And then as children get older and they're, you know, toddlers or preschoolers, really just going outside and splashing the puddles and playing tag and kicking a ball and, you know, for older kids, maybe jumping rope inside. In terms of eating, we know that healthy food costs more. It's crazy that it does, but it really often does. But some things we recommend actually cost less. Um, Water is cheaper than juice or fancy sports drinks. And there's no need to buy juice or sports drinks at all. Uh, Making food at home is often way healthier than eating out, which can be really expensive and less healthy. And changing habits like not eating in front of the TV or serving portions that are the size of the child's fist, these are either budget saving or budget neutral. Um, And I really feel like most of our recommendations have to either be budget neutral or budget saving. Earlier this year, Dr. Perrin, you advocated that parents should give themselves some grace when worrying about their children's pandemic weight gain because of increased stress and food insecurity at home. How has the COVID-19 pandemic really affected obesity? Yeah, I really am um, just very firm in that belief that we have to give ourselves a lot of grace. Um, The entire nation, but certain communities even particularly have been just through so much. And it's only, you know, just now starting to come to light all the many changes in health um, that are occurring. And we are just now starting to see some research come out on how children's weight has changed as a result of the pandemic. And unfortunately, the news there is not good. Susan Wolford and colleagues published an article in late August that showed that children ages 5 to 15, so that sort of school-age child, um, gained an average of five pounds more during the pandemic period than kids did in in a similar sort of pre-pandemic reference period. Um, And in looking at the number of children who are overweight or obese, that's that, you know, percentage has changed from 36% to 46%. So on the one hand, that's really striking. On the other hand, it doesn't come as much of a surprise to pediatricians in the trenches. We're seeing that shift anecdotally in so many of our patients day in, day out. But that being said, like I said at the beginning, I get it. It's been a really tough year for so many of our families. And since food is comfort in so many cultures, it's entirely understandable that we all would be eating more and looking for some quick, happy moments of eating tasty food. I do think that parents need to give themselves that grace, um, but also recognize um, and encourage that things like extra physical activity can help with that weight management and the mental health. So it can actually sort of be that dually focused intervention that maybe sort of recognizes how hard this pandemic has been, but also does something that um, prevents unhealthy weight gain. I, I want to go back and just clarify something. When you said that jump from 36 to 46 percent, is that just during the pandemic or is that over another period of time? Yeah, no, that's um, sort of what we think has happened with the incidence of obesity. It's I think the authors had said that it was about a, a relative increase of about 24 percent. So, you know, really impressive gains in the number of kids who are overweight or obese during the pandemic. So how can parents best support children's healthy lifestyle? Can you provide maybe specific examples that the parents listening here can um, apply in their day to day? Yeah. So the general principle that I like to endorse is to work healthy routines into your life. So all of us have those slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, those things that come up here and there that disrupt our best laid plants. But the best laid plans need to be best laid plans. Um, And if parents can work in small, healthy routine changes, then most of the days will be healthier and the overall effect can be incredibly powerful. One of our patients, for example, decided she was going to stop buying soda and serve water at dinner. That's just like it's a simple change. It's a budget neutral or budget saving change, right? But it makes such a big difference. She found she saved some money. She actually found the kids. She had been buying caffeinated soda and the kids didn't have that extra caffeine that she felt kept them up. She felt they slept better. Another one of our families, the mom took the television out of her child's bedroom. She felt like, you know, they already had a phone in the bedroom to have a TV. It was just like too much screen time. Um, And she felt that that really helped her preteen get more sleep. So 
small things like that every day can really make a big difference. We're all going to have those potlucks, those, you know, pic, you know, church picnics, the, you know, whatever. We're all going to have all of that. Um, but if we can work in some small things to our daily routines, um, keeping our homes as healthy as they can be, that really makes a difference. You know, Dr. Perrin, when you talked about um, budget neutral or budget deficit, I love the concept of that because what it's implying almost is that there is a way to eat better, to eat healthier, to um, um, sort of, you know, at times, of course, giving into temptation. But even outside of that, as you're trying to incorporate these habits, it doesn't have to bake the bank. And I think that's that's a, a myth that exists around also eating healthy is that I can't afford it. Um, but what I'm hearing from you is that there are ways to get to the other side and and not break the bank. I think that's right, Shireen. I mean, I'll be the first to admit it's harder for people who are on tighter budgets to eat healthier. And that is just, you know, kind of how food is priced in this country. And it's super unfair. But but that being said, there are lots of healthy foods that are way less expensive. And, you know, in in childhood obesity prevention, we think a lot about portion size. Um, and so obviously keeping portions smaller, again, the size of the fist so that it can grow along with the child can mean that we're not buying, you know, extra food, unnecessary expenses on food. Again, water is cheaper than sugar sweetened beverages. Many physical activity options are, are free or low cost. You don't need to join a fancy gym. You know, all of those kinds of things are, are worth thinking about. Makes sense. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Perrin. I think at this point, um, we're toward the end of the episode, but this is where I'd love for listeners to know about how they can connect with you and learn more about your work. Oh, well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Um, obviously, this area is near and dear to my heart, and I appreciate being able to be on your podcast. I think Yemlish is going to post my Twitter handle. And, you know, as my team and I finish studies, we really always work to publish our work if possible and and share our results with the media because we really want, you know, our work to be translated into action as much as possible. Um, so stay tuned. We hope for some exciting work ahead. Until then, we'll follow your Twitter and we will we'll put it in the show notes so folks can follow it there as well. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Perrin. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. I, I find that childhood obesity is is this behemoth of a problem but with the work that research like yourself are doing I, i'm hoping we're, we're headed in a very positive direction toward it and so we will follow your work to stay tuned thank you thanks again and so to our listeners out there after this episode head over to our social media on facebook on instagram and tell us what habit do you do every day to stay healthy now, you may not do it every day. It's okay. We'll give ourselves some grace, like Dr. Perrin mentioned. But what habit do you try to do every day to stay healthy? Head over to our Facebook, our Instagram, and answer that question. And with that, Dr. Perrin, thank you so much. Thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Yumlish Podcast. Make sure to follow us on social media at Yemlish underscore on Instagram and Twitter and at Yemlish on Facebook and LinkedIn for tips about managing your diabetes and other chronic conditions and to chat and connect with us about your journey and perspective. You can also visit our website, yumlish.com, for more recipes, advice, and to get involved with all of the exciting opportunities Yemlish has to offer. If you like this week's show, make sure to subscribe so you can hear more from us every time we post. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time. Remember, your health always comes first. Stay well.